fellow grade 11s. In the previous lesson, we saw how Huygens' principle helps us to explain how waves are able to spread out and travel around an edge. The ability of waves to do this is called diffraction. Let's recap a definition of diffraction from lesson 2. Diffraction is the ability of a wave to spread out as it goes past a sharp edge or through a slit. In this lesson, we will investigate what happens when we let a light wave pass between the two edges of a narrow slit. We are studying light, but waves of all kinds can be diffracted. You know that you can hear someone talking even if they are around the corner of a building. The sound waves from their voice are diffracted and they spread out around the corner. Look at the area photograph of waves in water that passes between two walls. You can see the waves change in direction and spreading out as they go past the ends of the walls. Huygens had come up with an explanation that works for all kinds of waves. Science loves ideas like that. A single powerful idea works to explain a whole lot of different phenomena. Let's see diffraction happen in water. We need a ripple tank again. Here, we can see the waves diffract, that is, they spread out and change direction as they pass an obstruction. Let's see it again in a diagram. We can draw rays to show the direction the wave fronts move in. The rays or arrows show the directions in which the wave fronts spread out. Remember that the ray arrows do not show the wave fronts, but the direction that the wave moves in. Look at the photo of the shadow of a razor blade. The shadow has light and dark fringes around it. How do these fringes form? As the wavelets travel outward from the edge, in different directions, they interfere with each other. So we get places of constructive interference and other places where there's destructive interference. That means we get light and dark fringes. Normally you do not see these fringes on a shadow, but this photo was taken in light of just one color. That makes it easier to see the fringes. Now see what happens if we place two barriers close together. There are now two edges. Straight wave fronts move towards this wide gap in a barrier. As they enter the gap, they don't simply move straight ahead, they spread out and form small circular waves where they go around the edges of the gap. Let's look at that again. Now we have point sources all across the gap. Each point is a source of new circular waves. Now watch this computer simulation of points in the gap making their own little waves. The circular waves interfere with each other. Can you see the nodal lines spreading out to each side of the gap? Along those lines, the wavelets interfere destructively and we get zero amplitude. The nodal lines reach the screen on the right hand side and there, at all those places, the screen will be dark. But at other places, the screen will be bright, where the wavelets interfere constructively. Can you point out one such bright place? That's right, in the middle of the screen, opposite the gap in the barrier. Then there are bright spots here and here, on each side of the central bright spot. And there are more bright spots on either side of the central bright spot. So instead of seeing just one spot of light, diffraction means that the light coming through a narrow slit appears as a series of light and dark spots or bands. This is what the diffraction pattern could look like on the screen if we use just red light. You can see diffraction fringes too if you hold your fingers close together, leave the narrower slit and look at the bright sky or a distant street light. You will notice two or three gray lines between bright lines, where the light shines through your fingers. Those lines are diffraction fringes. You'll notice that if you change the width of the gap between your fingers, you change the pattern of fringes. The pattern does depend on the width of the gap. Let's see what happens if we make the gap in the barrier smaller and smaller. As the gap in the barrier gets smaller, the diffracted wave spreads out wider and wider. Let's see if this really happens in water waves. For this, we use a ripple tank and make straight waves in the water. 
Look at the straight wave fronts as they reach the gap in the barrier. As they go through the barrier, they change shape and become circular. From experiments like these, we find that the spread depends on the gap width in the following way. The narrower the gap, the wider the angle of spread. We have looked at waves in water and drawings of waves, but does light really behave like water waves? We must test these ideas with real light. Here you see a beam of light from a red laser pass through a very narrow slit. The width of the slit can be adjusted by turning a screw. Watch what happens as the slit gets narrower. The bright and dark fringes spread out at a wider angle as the slit gets narrower. But the angle of spread does not depend only on the width of the slit. Each color of light has a different wavelength. Well, we find that the spread of the diffraction pattern depends on the wavelength of the light also. You will remember from the electromagnetic radiation lessons that the visible spectrum of light ranges from red to blue and violet. Red light has a longer wavelength than blue light. So if we shine just red light or just blue light on the gap, we vary the wavelength of the light. Now see what happens to the spread of the diffraction fringes in red light and blue light. Here is the diffraction of red light. And here is the diffraction pattern with blue light. Now compare the two patterns. Red light has a longer wavelength than blue light. And we can see that it spreads out more than blue light. So there are two relationships that determine the spread of the diffraction. The narrower the slit, the wider the spread. But also, the longer the wavelength, the wider the spread. To state this in more mathematical language, the diffraction angle is inversely proportional to the slit width, represented by W, but directly proportional to the wavelength, represented by lambda. We can be more precise about this relationship. The diffraction angle to the first bright line is called theta. We can write the relationship as sine theta equals the wavelength lambda divided by the slit width W. This relationship means that we can get information about the wavelength lambda and the frequency of the light if we know the width W of the slit and we can measure the angle theta. We can, for example, calculate the wavelength of the light from a yellow sodium street light. We have to pass the light through the slit and onto a screen. Here is the slit with light that interferes to form the first bright maximum on the screen. The angle theta is the angle between the horizontal line to the screen and the line from the slit to the first maximum. We'll use the relationship that you can see here. Sine theta is lambda divided by W. If we multiply each side by W, we can cancel the W above and below and we get a formula for lambda. For yellow light, this angle theta is only one degree. Your scientific calculator will show you that the sine of 1.1 degrees is 0 0.019. The slit is very, very narrow at 0 0.03 millimeters. Now put the figures into the equation we created. What answer do you get? You should get the answer 575,9 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. The wavelength of visible light is usually given in nanometers. One nanometer is 10 to the minus 9, so the wavelength of this yellow light is 575,9 nanometers. You notice that the quantities are very small and the measurements have to be extremely accurate. This is just what scientists want, mathematical relationships that give them methods to measure and do comparisons. In the next lesson, we will see how that enables scientists to find out what stars are made of. And that's all for this lesson. Don't forget to check out other videos in this series, especially the task video. Also look at the Mindset website at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye.